So, uh, as I said, I'm, uh, I'm Daphne, I'm the, the project manager of the MATCH project, and I'm uh, your moderator for this uh, webinar today. Um, the objective of our meeting today is really to, time, to take the time to reflect on our respective projects and to learn from experienced colleagues working in the field of labor mobility. Uh, we should reflect and ask ourselves how can we achieve um, our, our goals, uh, which are to develop schemes that are ethical, sustainable, and yet business-oriented, so quite a daunting task. As I think you are all aware, we've just started a very ambitious project uh, here called uh, the MATCH uh, project, and we aim at addressing labor market shortages in four uh, EU member states um, by enabling young talents from Nigeria and Senegal to work for companies in Belgium, Italy, Luxembourg, and the Netherlands. Uh, uh, specific uh, sectorial labor shortages have been identified, uh, as you know, uh, primarily in the ICT, technology, and digitalization sector. So this is uh, our core uh, business, but we, we know that there might be also uh, other sectors that we would need to, to cover. Not only do we aim at addressing uh, EU um, uh, labor market shortages, but we also want to promote investment in human capital and upscale uh, our young uh, talent skills and increase their empl employability. Um, so uh, this is quite of a, of, a, of a challenge ahead of us. As we speak, we have uh, started our project in mid-January and currently we are reaching out to potentially interested companies in the Netherlands and in Belgium and we really measure the challenges and difficulties ahead of us as we are facing particularly difficult time with the COVID-19 crisis. And actually our colleagues back in Italy and Luxembourg have temporarily uh, put their activities uh, on hold. In order to shoulder and enlighten us today, we have the pleasure to have our colleagues uh, from the Digital Explorer project, Mante and uh, Eugenia, and this Digital Explorer project has many commonalities with the MATCH project uh, as uh, they already have successfully managed to recruit ICT specialists from Nigeria and to bring them all the way to Lithuania. So both Eugenia and Mante will walk us through the key steps of their project with a focus on how to engage with pri private sector uh, a task which will require us to think a little bit out of the box as we as IOM are mainly used to deal with institutional stakeholders. And after this presentation, we will have the pleasure to welcome Cédric, Cédric Filet from uh, Aldelia. Uh, Aldelia, uh, I think most uh, of you are familiar with this company. It's a private recruitment firm with an extensive presence in West Africa. And Cédric will focus more on the recruitment phase and explain us challenges uh, linked to the identification of the pool of talents. When we exchanged informally in view of this webinar, uh, Cédric said that he wanted to challenge the participants and to show us not only the top of the iceberg, but also what is below the water. So we are very much willing to take up the challenge. Uh, Eugenia and Mente, please, uh, the floor is yours. Hello everyone, I will share my slides. Right, so, so I, will, uh, I will kick off our presentation. And just yes. a second. Yes, yeah, so I'll kick off our presentation. My name is Eugenia and I'll walk you through um, the structure of uh, Digital Explorers program. And then Mante will specifically focus on the private sector engagement. <clears throat> so the um, Digital Explorers is a pilot project, pilot mobility, labor mobility project uh, that at large is focusing on knowledge exchange between two uh, buzzing ICT markets, which is Lithuania and Nigeria. Lithuania is currently uh, positioning itself uh, very successfully as a fintech uh, center of Europe. We have a, a fast growing ICT market and Nigeria is one of the most um, 
fastest growing ICT market in Africa. And therefore, we we found this connection between the two countries, even if it's uh, if at first it might seem quite unexpected. So in a nutshell, our Digital Explorers program is a one year career advancement uh, program that takes Nigerian ICT specialists who already have uh, some experience in, um, in some tech skills in um, coding. Uh, we take them to Lithuania to work. So it's a paid employment to work in a selected local companies for one year and alongside they have skills enhancement program. Uh, we also try to encourage uh, as much as we can uh, network building between the two ICT markets so as to encourage more companies to look into hiring uh, Nigerian talents or African talents in general, but also create more business connections between Lithuania and Nigeria. So I um, want to talk a bit about who are in the, in the consortium of, uh, of our project. Uh, so we have five uh, different stakeholders representing both uh, public sector, for example, Enterprise Lithuania is a government uh, institution which is responsible for export and support of small and medium sized companies in Lithuania, among other things. Then we have uh, Code Academy, which is our technical partner. They are mainly working uh, in the recruitment stage, they, they help us to validate technical skills of the candidates, but also right now when the um, when Nigerian ICT specialists are already in Lithuania, they are in charge of the skills and enhancement program, that is trainings that we provide for the Nigerians. Then there is diversity development group, is, they are migration experts, so their role is to, to look at uh, all the migration side of the of the project, also to analyze the context in Lithuania, to look at similar uh, projects to for the lessons uh, that were previously learned. So they are our migration uh, uh, support. Then there is Ventures Platform, and this is our uh, local partner in Nigeria. They they are both. Um, they have a non-profit arm within their structure that works with. Uh, skills and entrepreneurs. They're also an investment fund that focuses on uh, ICT startups. So they're well positioned within the whole Nigerian ICT infrastructure to be the local representative of this project. And then there is Africo, which is uh, us, myself and Mante and our colleagues. And we are uh, sort of the glue that brings everybody together. We are the brain and the engine behind the project. So we are, we are managing the, the stakeholders, making sure that expectations are met on all sides. And of course, our primary job is to work with uh, private sector in Lithuania, engage the private sector, also work with uh, institutions, uh, awareness and so on. So like we really have a, a, a big chunk of the project in our hands and uh, I'm happy that we're able to share our knowledge with you today. So want to run through quickly a structure uh, and sort of a timeline of the of the project that uh, we have. This is um, this is a rather detailed uh, structure. So we have uh, three major parts within the project. So first part is creating a match. So this is where all the magic happens. This is where we outreach to the ICT specialists in Nigeria. This is where we also outreach to the companies in Lithuania and everything ends up in a, in a match. And this is the most difficult and the most demanding part of the project. The second part of the project is uh, what we call helping the match to be perfect. So this is the part where the Nigerian specialists already arrive in Lithuania. Uh, they're here for one year and there is different support that I will talk a bit about in, the, in one of the further slides. And the last part uh, of the, the last stage of the project is the reintegration part or making it easier to say goodbye. So after a year in Lithuania, the Nigerian ICT specialists those who are not retained, uh, they return back to Nigeria and we have a program in place to help them reintegrate, 
use acquired skills in the best way they can and uh, find uh, relevant employment or if there's anyone interested there's also uh, a possibility to to have to look into the entrepreneurial sides of things so these are like the main three uh, stages of the of the project and just to say where we are right now so we are right in the middle if you look at this uh, structure because the Nigerian ICT specialists are already in Lithuania and they have been here for half a year so this is actually like we've passed half of uh, of uh, of the project of the timeline uh, I think uh, this presentation will be shared with everyone uh, or it will be publicly accessible so you will be able to look at the like specific comp components of each stage but due to time constraints we I think we will move forward and if you have some specific questions perhaps we can address them at Q&A but basically yeah, there are three stages the pre-departure stage where we create the match integration being in Lithuania skills enhancement supporting for the companies and then reintegration back in Nigeria saying goodbye basically so just to give you also an overview what what have what have we done and what have we done until now so when we started in january 2019 we launched the application for the program in nigeria and we had in total uh, 1425 applications uh, what i can say uh, quickly about this part is that we tried to do a very targeted um, approach. Uh, so it wasn't like a huge awareness campaign in Nigeria because we were also somewhat afraid to be overwhelmed by the number of applications. So it was quite a targeted um, outreach and still we had 1,425 applications. Out of all those applications, we had around 150 interviews with, uh, with uh, pre-selected candidates whose uh, technical skills were already uh, checked. Then uh, 77 were selected to participate in a on-site matching exercise, which was hackathon. So this was something where we came together with representatives of the companies um, in Nigeria we gathered in Nigeria, so the Nigerian ICT specialists, ourselves and representatives of the companies for a week. Uh, and there were different uh, exercises, uh, there were trainings, but there was also a hackathon uh, where we grouped people and they had uh, specific challenges to work on. These were technical challenges as well. So at the end of uh, this whole selection process, we had uh, a matching done between 15 explorers and seven companies and these are uh, these are the ones that have arrived to Lithuania and are currently in Lithuania um, and Mante will talk more about the private sector engagement and how we uh, how we engage those uh, final seven companies another uh, another highlight for us or another big achievement for us uh, because lithuania doesn't have uh, diplomatic representation in uh, in nigeria and it was very important for us to figure out how we how we do the whole migration part so together with our institutions with our ministry of foreign affairs we've uh, we've reached uh, a solution where a visa center was opened in abuja and lagos which made it uh, much easier for us to um, to process uh, documentation for visas. I don't think that would be a problem for Belgium because I know that you have your embassy there. Uh, but for our pilot project, this was indeed a very uh, big achievement to to reach that. And uh, I'll talk briefly about the support that uh, we provide to the explorers. So Nigerian ICT specialists, we call them explorers, digital explorers, and to the companies. So first of all, the whole migration procedures uh, were covered by the project. So we took care of all the documentation and all the bureaucracy that pertains to that. And that was, and that was, a, huge, um, that was a huge incentive for the companies uh, to join. Then we also did a lot of soft landing activities for the digital explorers. So for example, finding, uh, helping to find apartments, figuring out transport, uh, giving information about shopping, phone cards, health uh, issues, uh, banking and so on. So, so th there was a lot of like practical support for the Nigerians arriving to Lithuania. 
then right now we have uh, uh, continuous workplace monitoring. So we are continuously engaging with the companies, also with explorers to see how is it going? What are the cultural work differences they experience? What are the challenges? And we try to mediate um, and uh, between the companies and explorers and also be sort of cultural mediators between them, managing some feedback loopholes and um, doing a bit of that cultural understanding between the two parties. And for the explorers, for the Nigerian um, uh, ICT specialists, we do a lot of uh, meetups, um, larger meetups uh, to, to get to know the Lithuanian wider society, but also more technical meetups where they get to know uh, Lithuanian tech ecosystem and do can do a bit of networking. So, uh, think that gives an overview of the program. There's many specifics and Mantana will talk more about the private sector engagement. All right. Yeah, so I'll, I'll try to dig into the peculiarities of engaging the private sector. And as Daphne mentioned, it's actually very different uh, than dealing with institutional stakeholders. And uh, we as Africa, we always felt like we have to be this camel on being uh, like using one type of voice uh, to talking to institutions and a very different type of voice to, uh, to talking to the private sector. Uh, so this picture is from the hackathon, actually, and I think this was a very big highlight uh, for the project uh, where we took some of the private companies that uh, in the end were interested in hiring uh, explorers. And there was definitely what we call a, a love moment between Lithuania's and, uh, and Nigeria's techies. Uh, but uh, where did we start, basically? Um, just a bit of a context, uh, how this project looked in the eyes of uh, Lithuania's ICT sector in the very beginning. So, first of all, Africa was already known um, for the ICT community as a stakeholder seeking to connect ICT markets of Lithuania and African countries. Uh, which means that since 2016, we had a partnership with our Ministry of Foreign Affairs. We had an annual event about ICT for development in Africa. Uh, and uh, some of the ICT companies uh, were like already aware of uh, those activities, even though there are very few Lithuanian companies that work in African countries. There are a couple, but it's not like a, a widespread uh, or commonly known uh, market, let's say Nigeria specifically, where ICT companies operate. But there was like a, a growing interest and, uh, and we had already a community of companies that knew us uh, as this organization working in this field. Uh, we also had uh, a quite established partnership with InfoWorld, which is an ICT association of Lithuania. And it was absolutely crucial stakeholder uh, for us that uh, helped us also work with the public institutions that supported the project in, in a lot of different ways, publicly in meetings and, uh, and so on. And uh, the very key reason why they did that is because uh, according to the study that uh, they performed, I think in 2018, uh, there was an expectation by the, by, that by 2020, Lithuania will lack 13,000 ICT specialists. Uh, and uh, according to their analysis, there was no way that this need could be covered by internal resources. Like they analyzed even, you know, if uh, all the students that go to study programming to universities uh, finish the studies and start working in Lithuanian ICT sector, it will not be enough. Um, another important thing is that this project uh, is what we call triple pilot and uh, what Eugenia also mentioned is that you know like we don't have established relationships we don't have uh, institutional presence in Nigeria in a way that we don't have an embassy so also like the, for the private sector it was something completely out of the box so we had to build the trust even though we were known, you know, as a as an organization that works in this field, at the same time for the private sector, no matter what, how how much they need ICT specialists, Nigeria was definitely not the first country that they thought of, you know, where to look for those specialists. Uh, so this brings me to the process, like how we tried to build that trust. Uh, first of all, uh, the very key part was the language, the tone uh, we used, uh, and we invested a lot actually in branding and high quality pitch. 
So now even the name like Digital Explorers and uh, the slogans we sometimes use that connecting ICT markets to through individual journeys and, and so on, we really tried not to make it sound as bu like bureaucratic. We tried to get into the ICT sector mode uh, in a way and, and build the identity. And I think we were quite successful with that, that you know both companies and, and Nigerians now identify themselves as digital explorers. It actually became a thing to be a digital explorer. Uh, then we did a, a really widespread uh, reaching out uh, through different uh, channels. Uh, what I mean is that we had like uh, a presentation about uh, the program, uh, about what it takes to be part of it and so on, that was distributed very widely. Uh, so we used both Infobalt, Enterprise Lithuania, Vilnius Tech Park, which is a tech hub and other hubs and Start of Lithuania, like a lot of institutions and we name here that uh, approximately 500 companies were reached, but this is actually like a humble number. It's it's more like what we could specifically identify that we did, but we distributed it very widely. So there would be like a buzz around uh, the program that people would know that it's happening, because uh, this is in a way also like a trust building exercise. Uh, however, I must say that this does not mean, you know, that if you distribute this very widely, that suddenly you will get a lot of companies reaching out to you and saying, yes, I want to be part of it. Because uh, uh, this, as I said, sounds like something very out of the box. And every single company has very different reasons why they would join it. And in a generic presentation that you distribute really widely, it's really hard to cover those specific niche needs of the companies. So then we did what we call active outreach to selected companies. And, and this is, uh, so we had like a short list of companies that we wanted to onboard. So we did analysis of, uh, of the ICT sector of uh, Lithuania. Uh, and uh, the active outreach we call like personalized emails, introductions. We would try to find people, you know, that could introduce us to the CEO of that company and would vouch that this is a good thing to do. Uh, and uh, then we moved to what we call intensive engagement, where we had approximately 40 meetings. So by intensive engagement, we mean that, okay, we, we had this active outreach, like let's say a personali personalized email, and the company said, yes, okay, we'd like to hear more. Uh, so we managed to get uh, 14 meetings where we came with a uh, personalized pitch, basically thinking what could be interesting for that company, like what benefits they would see uh, and would emphasize those specific benefits of the program for the company. So, and out of those uh, 40 uh, engagements, we managed to get 16 companies that signed the letter of intent. Uh, and by signing letter of intent, company basically agrees that they are interested to be part of the program, that we can publicly communicate that they are part of the program, that they give us uh, their specific interest of the profiles, let's say two Java developers with two years of experience with certain frameworks and so on, uh, and uh, that they will participate in, in the hiring process, but they do not commit to hire if they cannot identify the right uh, candidate. The only like uh, sort of strict measure in the letter of intent was that if the company says yes, they want to hire and we start the migration process, uh, if they change their mind within that process, uh, we, will, we would request to cover the expenses that we experienced uh, from the processes that we already started. Uh, yeah, so we had uh, 16 companies uh, that signed uh, that letter of intent. Uh, however, only five companies went with us to Abuja, to the hackathon. Uh, it was more like not, more, not all the companies felt that there was a need um, going together. They sort of trusted our HRs and technical people to do that, but there definitely was a lot of value in taking the companies uh, that went with us and one one of the very like tangible outcome is that all the companies that went together with us uh, to Abuja actually did hire people in the end and sometimes they hired people not that uh, not the profiles they initially wanted but they just spotted people that they liked and uh, basically they were you know in the end they were choosing personalities rather than skills or CVs this is what uh, what happened during that uh, hackathon uh, also, as you can see, you know, 16 companies uh, signed letter of intent, but only seven in the end hired, which means that uh, during the final interviewing process and uh, skills checkups, some of the companies could not find people uh, that they liked. 
uh, and there were certain uh, peculiarities around it uh, that I can say briefly later. So you see, maybe for the sake of yes. uh, time management, and as we are entering into more into the, the details of the recruitment, maybe you could wrap up quickly. And then okay. I think I'm sure there will be questions for you during the quick Q&A. So, sorry, sorry for that. Great. So few key lessons basically that we learned from engaging the, the private sector. So one thing is that I mentioned uh, there is perceived need uh, of 13,000 specialists, but basically the, the very actual needs of companies can only by, be found out by a very active personalized engagement. So this abstract big number that is there in the market and that is known all around for different stakeholders in, in Lithuania is very different when you come to a specific company. May, they may want to hire very senior people and then these programs are not necessarily attractive for very senior people. They might want uh, very specific programming languages uh, that is much harder to find in Nigeria and so on. So there had to be a lot of like this personalized approach with the companies. A very important lesson learned is also uh, matching uh, the business needs and the program needs. This is what Daphne also mentioned, you know, managing this ethical, sustainable approach, uh, but also understanding that you're working with the private sector. So let's say in our program, we decided to have this one year employment and, you know, there is a brain drain question and so on. But the, for the companies, this one year is very scary. ICT projects, sophisticated ICT projects usually last longer than one year. And for the company to let the person go after the one year is a very painful thing. Another thing, you know, we want to invest in junior professionals from Nigeria, but for the company as well, you know, hiring a very junior person, they understand that it will require a lot of their uh, training, onboarding, and maybe only like after half of a year, the person will deliver the value added for the company. And since we are not subsidizing salaries in the project, they are getting market salaries, and this is how migration regulation works. Uh, this was like a... I mean, in a way, it, it made onboarding private sector much harder. Um, I think another important thing was that companies that joined the program in the end uh, liked the fact that they are part of the program. Uh, I mean, they saw a lot of benefits, not only like filling the gap of the ICT specialists that, uh, that they need, uh, but also internationalizing, involving their current employees in such a program going together to the hackathon, um, networking among the companies that are trying to internationalize was also like a lot of value added. And as I said, Digital Explorers became also like part of the identity. Uh, relocation support, again, I mentioned, so uh, I'm not going deeper into that. Uh, and early involvement in the hiring process uh, is also very important. And not uh, whoever from the company, but a very specific person within the company is a tech lead uh, when hiring ICT specialists. And we saw a 100% uh, percent, uh, that worked for us. Let's say if we took an HR to uh, the hackathon in Abuja and the tech lead was not there, it was not as successful as if the tech lead was there. Because tech lead was choosing uh, people for himself or herself. Uh, in the team, and it's very different if the CEO decides to hire the person and if the tech lead decides uh, to hire a person. It's also, you know, like not only for the hiring, but the actual working already in the company, we definitely see that in the cases where tech leads chose people for themselves, we see a much uh, better and smoother uh, onboarding uh, uh, process and also working relationship. Uh, yeah, so I guess that's all the key lessons learned for now. And this is a lot of food for thought. Many, many thanks to you, to you both. I'm sure uh, we will have uh, many questions for, from the from the uh, uh, audience. You have really highlighted some of the key uh, challenges that we can already feel, but we have not uh, experienced yet. Cedric, um, without further ado, uh, please, uh, the, the floor is, is yours to dive a little bit more into uh, our challenges when it comes to the recruitment uh, of those young uh, talents. You have to unmute yourself. Okay, Daphne, thank you very much. Thank you very much as well for your, for your presentation. So good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Cedric, I'm calling you from uh, sunny London. 
but I'm having a um, South African rooibos uh, boat in uh, Mozambique. So we are already in, uh, in Africa. I will um, talk to you today about our experience uh, on the continent. So we've been operating over the last uh, 15 years and uh, we've celebrated um, these last months uh, or 11 years of business in, uh, in Nigeria. Uh, so I will go for on some uh, numbers first so to put in perspective uh, the, the the numbers of Nigeria, Senegal, globally speaking, Africa, and and Europe, and the countries where we will be operating with the, with a match project. And then I will explain how we are recruiting, what the recruitment process, uh, which could look very similar to the one we have in in Europe. And then we go into more details about the the challenges we we haven't thought about um, during the process and. Uh, Mante has uh, talked about some of them, uh, so we'll go into uh, into details on, on it. And uh, maybe uh, we talk about the, the situation. I'm, I'm sure some of, some of you have heard about the uh, the COVID-19. If you have switched on your TV recently, uh, and uh, we we'll discuss a little bit uh, how it could impact uh, the the future and the situation uh, over there. So, uh, in terms of uh, key figures. Um, you will see the Senegal and Nigeria uh, numbers compared to the European numbers um, in terms of population, labor force, but also how many people in terms of ICT are going on to, onto the market on, on a yearly basis. And um, this is very important to, uh, to look at it because um, just to, to give you an idea, uh, if we take uh, the Netherlands, Netherlands are the same population of uh, Senegal. Uh, if we take Belgium, Luxembourg and Senegal, it's pretty much the same population as Lagos. Yes, one city. Um, and that shows you the, the, the volume on the, on the last line of people will be um, going onto the market, will be graduated in, in ICT. Uh, and just in both Senegal and Nigeria, we've got um, a minimum of 50,000 people. And this is very conservative. Uh, because it's difficult to get numbers uh, today around 2% of the, the people going on the, uh, on the market uh, every year uh, are, are working into ICT. However, if you look at the average age of the population, um, there is many more tech and people are interested in, in technologies who are going on, on the market. So, but these numbers are very uh, conservative, but they are so we, we can um, think that there is many, many more people going on the market. So there is a big pool of qualified, hungry tech people. In terms of uh, the selection, uh, so how do we work uh, from Nigeria or from Senegal? Uh, very simple, three phases. We've got uh, where to find the candidate, where we identify him, then we test him, we assess him, and then we select him. Okay, so far, nothing new. Um, how do we do it? So we've got various tools and I will go back on this, uh, on this one on, on the next slides uh, in terms of the database. So we have an international database, both in Europe and in, in Africa. So we look into it, we tap into it. We have access to the Senegalese and Nigerian diaspora outside um, their home country, you know, outside Nigeria or uh, outside uh, Senegal and not only in Europe, they are, they could be in the neighboring countries, but they could be uh, as far as uh, US or China. Um, we've got our local teams uh, that have been working for years for us and have built their own database. Um, we advertise locally in terms of radios, papers, uh, social networks, uh, the WhatsApp, the Instagram, the Facebook, um, and the local websites. And then we do the headhunt. So technically speaking, very, very similar to what we could do in Europe. Testing, and uh, Mante has discussed about it, we can receive quite a lot of volume of, uh, of CVs. You know, even doing um, a very limited and targeted uh, search, um, they found uh, 10 for one. Uh, so imagine when we start to advertise on uh, LinkedIn, Facebook, it's, uh, it could be a thousand or more for one. Um, so we, we need to do uh, two things and uh, she, she approached the, the, the topic as well, you know, the art skills and the soft skills. Um, 
First of all, we need to make sure sometimes when you receive a fantastic CV that um, what's on the tin is what's in the tin. Uh, so we just need to make sure that uh, the CVs you received are accurate compared to the expertise of the people. So we've put in place some methodology and some digital tools where the talents go online, are recorded, are timed, uh, and they're filmed as well uh, during the, the moment that they pass, they attend the test. And um, that helps us to uh, monitor, but also to rank um, number of, of talents. So in a, in a period of uh, one day, one week, uh, we can assess 5, 10, 20,000 uh, talents. And then based on the, the art skill selection, we go into the, the soft skills uh, selection in terms of HR. Once we have identified these people, okay, we, we go to, for, for the selection based on the, the technical test, based on the personal interviews, based on the, the expectation uh, of the clients, what they want and what they need, which could be different sometimes. And then we submit the, the CVs. Uh, so it's, this period could take two weeks, two, three weeks, and we, we managed to, uh, to make it happen because uh, we've put in place the team and the digital tools. So it, it's really a mix between brick and mortars. We are on the ground and uh, all digital tools. Uh, we cannot do it with one, either only the, the team, the people, or only the, the digital aspect. You know, it needs to have a, a match and a process between, uh, between both. Talking about um, the, the database, I want to, to go into more details uh, bit, uh, before going into the, the challenges uh, about uh, the, the tools we, we are using. So as, you, as I said, you know, the, this international uh, database that we have to detail a little bit more because what's on the database, you know, sometimes it's, it's a big pool of, uh, of talents, but it needs to be organized. So depending on the countries, we need to uh, organize it uh, based on the language skills, you know. Um, it's not only uh, in, in Europe that we don't speak the same language, it's in Africa as well. So uh, main languages are English, French and Portuguese. So we have to, to adapt uh, our, our database um, and our, the people who are working on it uh, as well. In terms of advertising, um, so obviously we've got the, the, the Aldilia website, which is uh, quite known now and we receive quite a lot of uh, application on a, on a daily basis. LinkedIn uh, as well, it's a good tool, but it doesn't work that well in Africa. Um, and then there is some special database in the oil and gas, in the um, IT, depending on the, what, what we're looking for, uh, medias and the printed medias, which working quite well still in Africa. You know, uh, today in Europe, we don't uh, um, advertise on, on paper media, but uh, in, in Africa, you, you, you do so. Um, market mapping, this is, a, this is even more a service, but we use it um, once we've done the mapping to, to collect and to keep the, the, the candidates. That means, I had the example um, this week where uh, a big company has won a contract in, in Senegal to build a motorway. And uh, they, they don't have any office, they have never been there, they don't speak French uh, for, for Senegal. Um, and they have to recruit 4,000 people. And obviously the motorway is between two cities, so they want to recruit people in the capital and then up to the cities they will build um, um, the motorway in order to have uh, a social impact. And that's where uh, all digital platform can, can help because we will be able to, to find people on each cities, in each location, each community. Um, and that's quite a, quite a big work because we are able to say, based on the manpower plan, so the manpower plan is the list of people they will need during the, the length of the project. They will, we will need, be, we will be able to say, look, we will find, based on the job description and the job title, you will find the people here, here and then. Uh, if we don't find the people in the country, we will find the people in neighboring countries or abroad. And that's where we can bring expats, but we can document it. Um, networking as well is, is very important and we worked a lot. Um, that's, uh, that, that in Africa, the word of mouth and, and the networking uh, works, uh, works well as well. Um, and recently we, we launched the, uh, the Arriba job. It was more uh, uh, 
uh, a tool to develop the solidarity and to develop a new uh, model uh, to, to work in, in Africa and, and to recruit uh, where the, the companies would be able to, it's a marketplace where everyone would be able to, uh, to advertise uh, and to give hope to people because after the, the COVID-19 crisis, um, to go back to prosperity, we need jobs. So at least we are all self uh, advertising all our jobs on Arriva Jobs and uh, our clients advertise for themselves uh, as well. And um, this is a platform which will be growing very, very fast and because we've got lots, lots of interest uh, at the moment. If you have more, more question on it, uh, I will be able to go into more, more details because I'm, I'm conscious about the time. Um, now the challenges, here is uh, the interesting part. So you see, same phases, candidate identification, the interviews, the test, uh, and the selection. So fine, once we have done that, uh, you arrive in, in, uh, in Nigeria or in Senegal, and as Amante said, okay, where, where do we find the people? Where, which location, where we are, which medias? Do we do the same as, as Europe? Uh, no, uh, how do we manage volume? Because this is important, you know, uh, you can easily receive two, three, five thousand application for one position. So I can tell you that will smash your inbox. I don't know how many emails you're receiving on a daily basis, but uh, I have hundreds, 120, that's more than enough. So when you got 2000, forget it. Uh, so you need to get organized. Time scale as well. Sometimes the time is not the same, uh, it's not appreciated the same way. Uh, so you need to be organized to put in place uh, processes uh, and to impose your time scale. Budget as well. Budget needs to be very, very clear from the beginning. That could be costly, you know, going on the ground, uh, advertising, um, wasting time in receiving the, the wrong people. So this is what you don't see when uh, you say, okay, I will be recruiting. Recruitment is easy, you know, you you post an ad, uh, you get some CVs and you choose one. No, 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 it's a little bit more complicated and more volume. Um, and once you, let's say you have identified your, your candidate, okay, are the CVs you are receiving match, are matching really, really the, the person? Can the person is able to, to do what she said? You know, some people are very good salespeople. Uh, they are very less uh, IT developer. Um, so you need to double check that. Uh, logistics as well. Logistics is a key word uh, in Nigeria uh, or even in Senegal. The transportation, going to the meetings could take, if you want to cross the city, it could take two hours, three hours more, depending on where the, the candidates are coming from. I'm talking about Lagos uh, because Abuja would be different. Uh, and I'm not even talking to cities in the north where I wouldn't recommend you to go. Uh, and even forbidden, or even in the south, there is some logistics which needs to be organized. So whether it's face-to-face, -face, digital, do you have the, the same, the right person in front of you? Um, and then what is very important, and the point has been uh, uh, approached uh, earlier by Mante, you know, you need to, to do both interviews, the technical and the HR interview, you know, to make sure that uh, you've, you've got the right person, you know, uh, the person will be recruiting with this person, um, will um, we, we match and uh, that, that's that's very important. Um, then uh, you've got the, the selection once you, you, you have done your, your interview phase, um, you've got another logistics, you know, once you do, do your shortlist, you've got the contract, you've got the onboarding and especially depending on where these people will be working, uh, you need to do all the immigration, you need to be the contract, you need to be the, the salaries, the payroll, the taxes, the medical insurance, the pension. Uh, once again, uh, this is something we don't think about at the beginning. Um, this is not complicated. This is complex, yes, but it's not complicated. So it needs to be managed. Um, and and the, the, the last point is a cross-cultural training, uh, but not only for, for the one coming from Africa, from the one receiving from Europe, you know? Even uh, between ourselves, you know, in Europe, uh, sometimes it would be good to have some uh, cross-cultural training between ourselves to understand ourselves better. So you will face the ch same challenges uh, receiving uh, 
uh, a Nigerian person and uh, you can get a, a cultural training for Nigeria, but you will need another one from for Senegal. And each country will be different. Um, this is not a challenge. This is a chance uh, because you will learn uh, much more uh, from, uh, from, from these people you will be recruiting. And uh, uh, I take the advantage to have the mic and to ask uh, Omante the, the, the first question of the Q&A. Uh, sorry, Daphne, if I'm disrupting, but uh, my question would be, will this Nigerian brought only tech technology or ICT or what about their culture? What uh, the, the, the company where received them, received technically from them, but also uh, in terms of culture. And that, I think that's, that's uh, an interesting point uh, for us to, to know because I'm, I'm pretty sure that uh, on top of the technical aspect, there is some ideas, drive, innovation, um, which would be different if you would have recruited someone from Lithuania or from Europe. Um, so sorry, that was my first question for Q&A. Um, and then last point, and I'm looking at the time, I'm still uh, fine. Um, COVID, COVID-19, you know, today, uh, a month ago, we were recruiting someone to go to an office and they have to go on the traffic and they have to sit at nine up to five or to six, depending on. But now, where is home? Where is the office? Why do we need to be there? Um, you know, I'm, uh, we are talking from uh, each other home place. So that generates lots of aspects, uh, lots of uh, changes and um, maybe a, a cultural uh, revolution, you know, at least in terms of uh, HR, in terms of way of working. Uh, I've got even clients like in Africa, whether they're in the chemical industry or in the fuel distribution, who are telling me today, 80% of our staff is working from home and it's working very, very well, very, very well. And it's not only uh, tech, uh, it could be uh, assistance, could be HR, could be payroll, it could be uh, cost controller, finance, whatever. And that will make uh, their life much, much better. So people, companies, industrial companies in Africa are thinking about a new way of working. So you need to think about all the HR aspects if you decide to recruit someone from home office of a remote work, because today, and more and more, we'll be able to, to, to recruit and to work remotely, whether we want to or because we have to, based on the pandemic, on the, on the situation or, or anything. Today, it's difficult to, to plan as, as we could see. So the HR aspects are important. The legal aspects are very important. The contract, the taxes, uh, benefits, everything. This is uh, key and this needs to be thought in advance. Um, Sometimes, and not only from Africa, uh, I can tell you from London, sometimes the infrastructure, the internet connections uh, is not that simple, but at least this needs to be organized. And then all the, um, the reporting uh, aspects uh, as well, you know, uh, you need to make sure that uh, someone working remotely works. Um, what is he doing? What you're expecting? What is he expecting from you? And these kind of things needs to be uh, uh, managed and thought and, and discussed. So that's a, an interesting slide uh, as well for, for future. And we cannot not think about it. You know, it's uh, it's something we, at least we need to, to approach it. Um, no, thank you, Cedric, for, for uh, this, last, uh, this last point. Uh, I think that uh, indeed uh, uh, COVID-19 is in everybody's uh, mind. Um, again, for the sake of time management, uh, as we only have 25 minutes left, I, I'd like now to to open the the, the discussion with our with our participants. And uh, uh, let me thank you, really, uh, colleagues from Africa, uh, Cédric, for your truly ex uh, excellent presentations. Actually, I see that no one has uh, posted a, a question yet, which means that uh, your presentation were truly uh, good and no one, you know, you have answered all our questions, uh, which is <laughs> amazing. Now, more, more seriously, may, let me actually, Cédric, uh, get back to uh, one of the points that you stressed. Uh, about uh, integration, uh, because I would like to um, uh, actually uh, abuse uh, my position as a moderator to ask uh, the first question and to kick off our debate today. 
Mente and Evgenia, uh, of course, uh, as you have highlighted in your presentation, uh, there is quite uh, a, a stretch uh, for these young talents to come uh, all the way from Nigeria to Lithuania. Uh, uh, I believe that the, the culture are, are, are quite radically uh, uh, different. And uh, in one of the slides, uh, you um, uh, have pointed out the fact that you are uh, uh, mentoring uh, your, your explorer and that uh, you're, you have really developed uh, some sort of solid um, uh, integration programs. Could you expand slightly on, on, on that? Uh, because uh, actually, interestingly enough, uh, companies that have approached us have raised this, this problem. And they were very curious to see how in the match program we would actually uh, ensure the soft landing, uh, if you will, of our young talents. Uh, yeah, so I think what, one of the very first things we did, I'm not sure it would be also like so relevant for your context, but uh, for the selected explorers, we straight away uh, told them that they're going to be cultural challenges. Like we didn't try to sugarcoat what Lithuania is. Uh, I think uh, it's uh, it was also good that they met before they left uh, Nigeria, you know, their tech leads and, and so on, and saw that Lithuanians are much more reserved, you know, not as talkative. I mean, they, they already had a bit of an idea what uh, would be waiting for them in, in Lithuania. Uh, but then when it comes to support, what we did, uh, of course, we worked uh, quite a bit with companies. We asked them to assign uh, internally, like to have a buddy and a mentor, and it's better that the buddy is not like your... Uh, direct superior, right? That's someone that you can have a more informal relationship. Uh, then we also uh, uh, gathered a number of Lithuanian people uh, as local buddies, like people that are just random people. Most of them were actually Lithuanians who lived abroad before themselves, so they sort of were aware what kind of challenges people have when they move to a new country. And we have a very lively, uh, actually, engagements with those uh, local buddies. Like we have a WhatsApp group, and there is a lot of action. Like at some in the beginning, we had to support a lot of explorers by ourselves, but then we saw it, like it, it, step by step, this support drifted towards the local buddies as well. Uh, and uh, I think, I mean, the key thing is just to be very aware of the context. Uh, you know, let's say Lithuania is another challenge is we don't have a huge diaspora communities, which meant that explorers will be basically uh, one of the very few Nigerians in Lithuania. Yes, there are students, they managed to find some students, uh, but we knew that they will, they will need more support from us because uh, there will be not so many uh, people that they are uh, more related with. But still, even though, uh, no matter what, how much we thought about it, um, when they arrived, we realized that the shock is even bigger. You know, we went for shopping. They didn't know what it means to have uh, warm clothes, like, because they never felt what it means when it's cold. So we went, you know, to buy, like, winter jackets, and people were asking, is this, is this warm enough? Like, because, the yeah, it's just so different. I think for the, for the companies, uh, what is important also to understand is that there's no magic training or magic bullet that you can, you know, listen to a two days um, speaker or in, on intercultural communication and it would solve all your problems. I think what is very important to understand for companies who are hiring uh, these talents and especially if they haven't been previously exposed to, to people from Africa or even just any other countries, which is a case of some of our companies. These are the first international talents that they have. Uh, so it's important to understand that it won't be a one day challenge, that it will be a continuous uh, process and that you would have to come back yes. and review what you are doing. And we are sort of serving as a cultural mediator in some cases, but it's a very individual and tailored assistance then. It's that what I'm trying to say is not enough just to have a training, but it you have to think of a, a system in place how you provide this individual support both for the companies and for the talents. No, absolutely. Uh, here with the MATCH project, uh, we will develop also a buddy system and we are lucky that uh, in uh, the destination country in Europe, you have quite a large uh, diaspora community. Uh, uh, but Cédric, as you, you, you yourself, you raised this integration question, would you have some tips for, for, for us? 
uh, as I believe that you've seen uh, a lot of uh, challenges uh, uh, there as well. Yes, uh, we, we could uh, we could do a full uh, webinar, uh, but I might make you laugh. But uh, I the, the main thing that the Nigerians are missing, you know, when they're traveling uh, to Europe uh, is their spice. You yes. know, they have very spicy food and oh, they really? find the food very tasteless in Europe. Uh, yes. That's funny, they can adapt very, very well, but the spice, you know, you can put as many as a chili, curry and so on, it's not enough. Um, but except that, yes, there is some uh, cultural challenges. That, yes, you, you, you will learn from them, they will learn from you. Uh, the, you learn every day, seriously. We've been in Africa 15 years, we know a lot about Africa, we know this, this, and we are learning every day. So uh, that's definitely a day-to-day -day learn and challenging and refreshing time um, because you are creating. Um, so what you need, you need to get out of your a priori and this is very difficult, uh, your own thinking and you need to be very open-minded and not to be worried about asking questions. The why, there is no stupid question. Why do you say that? Why do you understand that? Um, because after it goes into details, you know, you think you understand, but so, a small detail, a small word, and that's the depth of words, you know, uh, when you learn a language, you, you learn it flat, you know, that these words mean this, uh, but what does it mean technically, the culture, the, the experience, the history yeah. of the world, um, this, is, this is very important. So, yes, this is a challenge, but this is not... Uh, it, not impossible. So, but the spice, seriously, it's no. important for Nigeria to bring this, their spice with them. Thanks, Thanks for, the, for the tip. That's, uh, that's indeed uh, uh, an, an important one. Uh, I really invite uh, all our participants, uh, please, to, to post uh, your, 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 your questions uh, um, as we, we really want to uh, uh, address uh, what is of interest uh, uh, to, to you. Uh, one uh, one question um, uh, uh, to uh, our colleagues from uh, the Digital Explorers uh, uh, project. Um, so, in terms of selection process, uh, I think that we would like to understand uh, uh, a bit more how the recruitment has been spread out. So, are you aiming at having, after one year, a new batch of, uh, of explorers uh, coming to uh, Lithuania? Uh, one uh, very uh, important uh, uh, question as well uh, is, um, I understand that the initial target number was 50. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, we currently have 15. So if you could just give us a few uh, um, uh, details, um, uh, and, and, and then we will uh, uh, look at uh, other questions raised by the participants about the return. But first, maybe the, the, the recruitment. So I'm, I'm thinking that one of the differences that uh, there is between uh, digital explorers and the match project, as far as I understand, is that uh, the match project, you will be uh, recruiting one by one or as there is a need from the companies. Uh, whereas, whereas what we did, uh, we did a batch recruitment. Uh, it was very important for us and it's something that Mante mentioned that we've been cre we started creating uh, an identity of digital explorers. We started to creating a program that has, uh, that people can identify with. And it was also, um, when we think about logistics of bringing people to Lithuania, uh, it's much easier to manage them when they are in a bigger group. So therefore we, uh, our recruitment process was done in the beginning of uh, 2019. And we just decided that, um, this is, these are the two or three months that we are doing recruitment and then we're going to stop, bring the people to Lithuania and they will start uh, working in the companies. So once we finished the recruitment process, there were no more uh, 
uh, recruitments, even though we started to have companies um, coming approaching us uh, for being interested to recruit from Nigeria. So I think that's that's the difference between our two projects. So our all the recruitment was done in the beginning of 2019. It was very intense process. We had to uh, do it do recruitment of companies and of the explorers at the same time so that that was indeed a super intense time for us and the um it was done so because our project uh, was limited in time altogether so we had to make sure that people come and have one year in lithuania and then there's time left for reintegration so at that time there was no possibility for example to extend our project which we have right now and that brings me to question of the target numbers. Um, what we have uh, thought initially and uh, something that Manta mentioned there was this study done that in Lithuania we are missing 13,000 uh, ICT specialists. And from our initial conversations with ICT companies, we also had a feeling that yes, indeed, there, there is an interest. And we had 40 companies that were initially interested and wanted more engagement but it becomes very different when you come to the point where the person has to sign a contract with a person so that's whole process from yes i'm interested into let me put my signature here is is very challenging and there are different things also happening in between for example we had a company that had a change in management and therefore they decided not to participate anymore um, also the migration process um, and the time that you have to wait for the person to come to your to, to your to work with you is also a challenge with the companies because when they want a person, they want him to start next week, not in three months. But migration process does take time. And uh, that's why when we are looking at the companies that are ended up hiring people and you look at their motivation, it's not necessarily because they were missing uh, technical people, but because they were part of the program and it, it became cool for them to be a digital explorer as a company as well. And right now, and this is and this is probably, of course, something that we that we bear in mind in terms of uh, of branding and, and and communication. I see some more questions coming in, so just let me uh, follow the, the thread of um, of, uh, of questions. Uh, so here in Belgium and in in the Netherlands, uh, as I as I explained in my short introduction, we've started really this active uh, outreach to to the companies. One big question that we have and that you have alluded to in your presentation uh, uh, is the fact that. Uh, we, of course, have design programs where we foresee temporary uh, placement in Europe and then a, a return. And as you explain, the companies have to invest a great deal in those young talents, in those explorers. It takes quite some time for the, the worker, if I understand well, to warm up, to be then productive. And then comes, of course, the end of uh, the already the end of the program and the person has to return. And from the discussion that you had uh, back in Lithuania with employers, can you estimate more or less the number of candidates who will be sponsored to stay in Lithuania rather than to return to Nigeria? Well, so uh, it's now, like now it's a decision moment. So uh, we don't know for sure yet uh, how many of them will be retained or at least companies will try to retain them. Uh, we know that two companies already decided or like one specifically decided and started the process and that company has uh, three people now on the, well, they have four people on the team, but they, they have decided for now for the three uh, to retain and others are thinking. I think another thing what I want to raise is actually it's not only the the interest of the companies to retain the people longer, but actually explorers themselves, you know, like they come they just start feeling that they are there, that they are learning, that they are finally feel comfortable. And it's also frustrating for them to think that now they have to go back. Like now is the moment where they need to think again, you know, that they need to go back. They need to look for another employer and so on, because they just started feeling comfortable actually at, at this company. And we have a lot of discussions with our partners in Nigeria, like how do we look at it? Uh, are we upset if most of them stays? 
but I mean, our key sort of takeaway is that one year is really a short period of time. Uh, you know, most or like a number of Nigerian startups or better uh, companies like the more well established companies are established by people who came back from abroad, but not after one year, they came back after five years. And this yes. is what we also hear from from our explorers that they say, you know, like they also say that, OK, if this program ends for me and I might need to go back to Nigeria now, I will still look, still look for opportunities to go abroad again, because now I feel like I can and I want to get more uh, more experience. So it, it is a very tricky moment. At the same time, I can say that there are explorers that are uh, really ready and interested to going back. And these are usually more senior people. Uh, so there are, you know, like quite senior experienced engineers uh, who came with an idea that they just want to get this international experience to see the new market. And they feel quite comfortable going back because actually they are very well paid in Nigeria as well. Because uh, uh, this, this is a very is, interesting uh, uh, yes, point so for, for our co consideration. I see uh, that colleagues uh, are, are asking a, a question with regards to the recruitment process. And Cédric, uh, back to you, uh, uh, maybe to ask you a question. Uh, let me be a bit blunt here. Uh, we, uh, um, in our previous experience, uh, we uh, know we have been confronted with the fact that it is difficult not to face interference with the recruitment process. Uh, this uh, uh, problem of a, of a fair recruitment, ethical recruitment of the talents can be really uh, 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 challenging. Uh, so uh, how can we ensure actually that, uh, that uh, the recruitment is, is, is fair? Uh, and another question, and maybe this is also for our uh, colleagues uh, uh, from uh, Africa, uh, what about the gender balance? Because uh, in the match project, we are very uh, conscious uh, of the fact that uh, women may not have the same uh, chance, and we really want to promote 30% of female uh, applicants. So, uh, is this a realistic target? Cedric, maybe uh, first reaction. Okay. So in terms to, to refer to the, um, the, the, the first question, fair <clears throat> is, is key, obviously. Uh, recruitment there is a lot of subjectivity especially when you, you go into um the soft skills you know the matching with the person you know <clears throat> however in terms of uh, technical aspects there is no uh, uh it's very very pragmatic you know we've got tests um and even sometimes if we are approached by someone who wants to put his nephew his son his neighbor whoever someone from the village whatever no it goes through the test so there is no negotiation possible um, and they know and uh, we are tough, you know, like um, like in Nigeria, <clears throat> it's uh, it's very direct um, and um, we, we have to because for us, that's our reputation, you know, and uh, this is very important to have the right people, but even for the talents, you know, if we are not fair and if we uh, don't provide, propose the right candidate, the right talent, the talent won't be able to do the job, it will not fit in the company, uh, it will be a failure for all of us. So this is not important, this is very important and uh, that's not a problem to, to, be, to be very, very strict. Uh, however, recruitment is not an exact science, you know, sometimes you make mistakes in recruitment. So after a period of time, you realize, oops, my mistake whether the talent, whether it's it, the candidate, it, it's uh, the, the client. So um, it, it happens, it happens, and we need to uh, to accept it. In terms of uh, equal gender, for us, it is very important. For, for us, it's natural. 50% uh, of the Alelia staff are women. Facts. So that means when they recruit, they recruit women as well. <clears throat> Men recruit women. Uh, for us, we, we are fair. And we're not recruiting women because they're women. We're recruiting women because they're good, you know. And we've got experience in uh, in Ghana uh, where we had to put in place some training programs. It was not in, in IT, in uh, ICT. It was in mechanics, electric, uh, HSC, oil and gas. So very, very technical, <clears throat> coming out of uh, technical engineering uh, universities and so on. We've done the first program 
of 15 people, you know, <clears throat> and the first 15 were all men, but it was the first organization we, we didn't know and we, we, it went very, very difficult and we didn't have lots of time to do the communication toward the talents. We've done the, the second year, we've done uh, the same program with uh, 33 candidates, talents being selected. But before we've done lots of communication towards women saying, hey, you can join this program, you can come, you can carry on your studies and so on and so on. You don't need to go home. And 40% were women. The top five were women. So um, today in Africa, uh, there is more and more women uh, who are graduating, who are following courses. Um, so I think this is important to have <clears throat> uh, objective. 30% is, is a good one. We could even try to, to reach uh, uh, more in the, in, in the future. And at least uh, if we recruit, we will, we will try to, to do so. Um, but and based on the volume as well, uh, of, of candidates, I think this is really, really uh, achievable and women are excellent, excellent candidates, excellent talents. So we really, really recommend and this is very important to, to have a balance in, in the team when you recruit a um, number of people. So uh, no, for me, I'm very confident that uh, you, you, will, um, you will be able to recruit and to, to reach this 30% uh, uh, objective, definitely. Thank you, Cédric, uh, for these words of, uh, of wisdom. As we're reaching the end of this uh, webinar, uh, colleagues from Africa, anything to add on those two points? About, about women, uh, we had an ambition to, to have more women in the, in the selected uh, digital explorers. Right now, we have four women out of 15 that have uh, arrived to Lithuania. So that's, that's almost 30%, I think. Um, but right now, uh, and that brings me to the question of the target uh, that we had previously. Right now, we are, we are working on the extension uh, within the project, uh, and we want to target uh, 15 um, females who would do internship type of program in Lithuania. And this would, would be specifically in uh, data analytics, uh, moving towards data science. So and this is our way of um, kind of compensating that we haven't managed to reach a higher number of uh, women in the first track, but also uh, this is also our way of managing uh, what Manta was mentioning, this brain drain, brain gain tensions. Uh, because as we're starting to see a lot of explorers, current explorers and companies who wanna continue this, their employment relationship, and uh, we think that an internship um, program with like an internship spin-off within our current program can uh, mediate these tensions because th those females would come for an intensive training they would have placement in companies and then they would return back to to nigeria and will be um, assisted in their reintegration so to find jobs that that would match the skills that they have been polishing or acquiring while in lithuania but that's still in the making, so it's uh, there are no results. We cannot uh, we cannot probably. So we can schedule another webinar, <laughs> within a, yes. a, a few months to discuss that precisely. This is this is great. This is, uh, we are reaching the, the end of, of this uh, of this meeting, but this was really really a very valuable uh, feedback, and thank you very very much for taking the time to share uh, your wealth of uh, of expertise. Uh, we, we bear in mind uh, uh, after this, uh, this discussion the importance of uh, uh, really uh, a tailor-made uh, actually assistance to the, the companies. Uh, it's not good enough just to brand the project. We really have to dive into the specifics of the, of the, of the market and guide the, 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 the companies. Uh, we we, we uh, bear in mind, Cédric, the importance of the sourcing and the testing of the, of the candidates, both to preserve the integrity of our programs, the ethical standards, but also the high quality of the of the recruitment thanks to uh, your uh, input we also uh, now understand better the importance of uh, the fact that the onboarding is not limited to uh, let's say the visa uh, 
uh, and uh, and uh, the really practical uh, uh, things, but we really have to look at uh, uh, yes the human side of things. And Cedric, of course, we will think of uh, buying spices uh, for our, our young uh, talents. This is a, a very important tip. But thank you uh, very, um, very much uh, uh, for for that. Uh, um, so um, we will, um, uh, uh, of course, uh, keep in touch uh, uh, with you uh, and. Uh, uh, have uh, we had questions that we could not actually answer uh, in in details, but uh, that we will share with you uh, for uh, for feedback uh, uh, with regards to, uh, for instance, the more detailed administrative aspects of uh, of, of things. Uh, and uh, I see uh, already that you have made yourself available to uh, for bilateral conversation with our experts. And thank you very much for for that. Uh, we will be in touch, as I said. Uh, uh, I think uh, uh, we we really hope to be able also to bring uh, some some uh, highlights from our own experience. Uh, have a lovely day, everyone, and uh, talk to you soon. Goodbye. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Bye. 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 Goodbye.